Welcome to Closeted History, the podcast where we out the queer and trans history that you never knew. I'm Destiny, I use she, they pronouns, and I am joined by my good friend Haley. Today, we're going to be talking about But I'm a Cheerleader, the 1999 cult classic, Jamie Babbitt's directorial debut starring Natasha Leon, Clea Duvall, and Michelle Williams. It since has become kind of like a cult classic and definitely like a rite of passage, especially as a woman loving woman or femme presenting person. It's definitely a classic. So we're just here to talk about the movie, kind of our thoughts, and celebrate Women's History Month by talking about a woman-loving woman movie. So, Haley, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of tell folks about who you are and more about you? Yeah. Hi, Haley. I use uh, she, her pronouns. And I was someone who was raised by a mom who worked at Blockbuster during this time period. So, I have a lot of opinions on movies during this era. I remember seeing them and really questioning the uh, the cover. I remember the poster very vividly in my Easy. brain. Um, so this is a great movie, and I'm really excited to talk about it with you. We both bonded over this pretty early in our relationship. Yes, yes. And actually, Haley and I, Super Strange, ended up working together after not seeing each other for like, I don't know, 20 years. We went to middle school together <laughs> and then ended up working together. And now uh, we're best gal pals. And here she is on the podcast. So thanks so much for joining me. So yeah, you mentioned the cover. And I guess that's a really good place to start is that that definitely caught my attention as well. She has that like sad pouty look with her pom poms and just it immediately introduces you to the color palette, which, you know, I don't want to say too much. We'll talk more about in a little bit. But yeah, the cover is definitely enticing. What kind of like drew you to it as well? It's funny because at first I remember seeing this poster. She had a very kind of like just a blank stare on her face. And it being called, but I'm a cheerleader, I was like, oh, is this like making fun of like blonde people who are cheerleaders? I was like, mm. So I kind of wrote it off for a while. I didn't like have any interest to see it. Uh, but then I saw it at a sleepover and I was like, oh, this is way different than I thought it was going to be. It is not about like a cheerleader who silly blonde jokes are made about her during it. But yeah, the <laughs> colors were very interesting. Yeah, she's definitely not your typical teenager. So anyone who hasn't seen the film or doesn't care about um, spoilers, it's starring Natasha Leone. She plays a teenager named Megan who goes to a rehab camp. It's essentially like conversion therapy because her parents send her there because they suspect that she is a lesbian. And like the very first scene, uh, so, you know, we've established (laughs) the cover, but from the very first scene, you immediately know that it is not going to be one of those like typical cheerleader movies. And I think that like, it's funny because I want to say that Bring It On came out in the same year. And so I feel like that's kind of why I like wrote it off for a while. Like you said, you just thought that it was like some cheerleader movie. And there were a lot of like, I don't know what to call them because like Jawbreaker came out, that other cheerleader movie, Sugar and Spice. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like a lot of those movies were coming out. Um, so I just like, I was like, oh, you know, I'm not interested in that. But then, you know, as soon as you start the movie, like the very first scene is, you know, a a pair of tits just right in your face. Mm -hmm. Um, And the very like stark contrast of like the orange bra cheerleader kind of set with like the very pale blue background I just I I really really love the coloring in this movie and I feel like it kind of uses that to tell the story as it goes on I feel like like in the beginning with her parents it's like very like muted colors like yellow browns You see the orange in the cheerleading outfit, but like that's only in that context. Everything else is like very, very muted. And then as soon as she arrives to the house, that's when like 
you really see those contrasting like blues and pinks. I feel like the colors that we see throughout the film, like from that point, kind of like tell the story a little bit more. What were your thoughts about the color palette? Yeah, it's interesting that you talked about all the other movies. I kind of forgot that all those movies, because like Bring It On came out in 2000. So it came out right after this. But like, I probably wasn't watching this movie in 99. I don't know when I first saw it, but and there was a lot. It was such an emphasis on like high school dance cheerleading type of like performance that really made me think like, oh, this is what happens in high school is you you join and you do cheerleading or you do some kind of like dancing thing. Um, but Jawbreaker was a movie I pretty positive I saw before this one. Me mm-hmm. And they both had very similar colors clothing wise that the teenagers were wearing it was very mm-hmm. like saturated colors had like the bright colors with it so i i think that's one of the reasons i was really attracted to this at first because i liked the movie jawbreaker and had saw it first mm-hmm. um, and i definitely when they pulled up to that house it was just like that perfect pink house and it had the perfect like flowers in the front and all everything that the boys had were blue like everything they had their beds I know the scene like later where they're using different tools, all blue, all the girls had all pink. Like I think even the vacuum, Mm -hmm. everything that they used was pink. And and it just looks so like fake in a good way. This looks so like Barbie and like Ken plastic world. Yeah, I think I was watching like a video essay one time and it was it said like Tim Burton meets Barbie is like the way to describe that house and maybe it's just kind of the mid-budget movies if like that magic is gone you definitely don't see movies like that now but I don't know I I feel it also kind of reminds me of um, Edward Scissorhands oh I have that note too yeah Yeah. because like the the houses and like and like how everything's it's so pastel-y but also like so saturated I don't know the the dichotomy is wonderful I love it But, and I feel like maybe I should have prefaced with this. The movie is definitely a satire. So we are not laughing or advocating for conversion therapy. And that definitely ties into the storytelling of the color palette being so saturated and every single item, like down to the vacuum being pink, you know, it's really that ridiculous. And so they use that as a part of the storytelling with the satire would you Um, consider this movie camp yeah it's very campy you know i know there are lots of debates about what camp is and what it isn't but you know what camp is when you see it and you definitely see it in this movie and just the way that the movie shows and doesn't tell yeah as soon as you said that i just kept thinking about the mom of uh, rocky and he's mm. over there dancing over and she just is like so furious and she doesn't really need I mean she does say at one point she gets mad at him for like drinking through the straw yeah. and is like drink this other drink it's more masculine drink it like a man yeah drink it like a man yeah yeah by the way she's great in this movie the the mom uh, Kathy how do you pronounce her last name mm-hmm. also known as the woman from Casper oh, yeah Kathy Morar. Marardi? I have no idea, but she does a wonderful, wonderful performance. And like I've watched some of the behind the scenes and everyone just said that like she was really, really great to work with and like very adaptive. I feel like she's kind of one of those hidden actors that like you forget how good they are until you're like, oh shit, yeah, okay. But yeah, her most recognizable role it probably is Casper, at least for people least- our age. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, also, Natasha Leon was only, mm. like, 17 during mm. the filming of this. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and it's so funny. She actually, like I said, I watch a ton of, like, interviews and behind-the-scenes stuff on YouTube. But she got the part because she found the script in Clea Duvall's car. And she was like, where's my part? And, you know, Clea Duvall talked to Jamie, and Jamie was into it. And so they found a part for her, and it it all worked out jamie babbitt directorial debut what a banger what a good thing to start with yeah i'm wondering what else she she directed she directed gilmore girls Mm -hmm. like 18 episodes she also worked on silicon valley a tv series called girls i've never heard of that she also directed russian doll uh which also stars natasha leon and she was the director of a league of their own which is a really really amazing show it's one of the best queer represented shows i've ever watched like 
ever. Um, and the TV show, not the movie, because the movie is definitely not that. Yeah, yeah, Elliot Page has talked about this movie as well, saying that was mm. really important for him because I didn't know this, but he was also sent to a conversion camp. Oh, wow. I didn't yeah. know that either. So he kind of spoke out about this movie and how important it was. Yeah, well, and I mean, since we're talking about it, I think that it is important to kind of know that conversion therapy is definitely still a thing, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, so the, the film, I love that it takes a topic that is very serious. So conversion therapy, obviously, is still an issue, but it kind of like subverts the absurdity of this practice and that's what makes it funny is that like in what world would it make sense of like oh i'm gonna send you to this camp and it'll make you straight and nothing is funnier than rupaul wearing a shirt that says straight is great i definitely want one of those shirts yeah we talked about uh halloween costume ideas with that he's like talking to megan in the beginning he like sits down he's like i'm an ex-gay megan i need more rupaul movies is what i need yeah yeah, RuPaul is quite the character. I did notice some of the things at the camp, like there was plastic on the bed covers. And I felt like that was like really indicative of the AIDS epidemic because this movie came out in 1999. I feel like that was still very present in people's minds. You know, people were afraid during the AIDS epidemic to even touch people like I remember that Princess Diana like when she shook hands with somebody who had AIDS like that was like you know groundbreaking but so like in the movie you also kind of see that context and I feel like it might be easy to miss if that's not something that you're familiar with. I was thinking about the scene where they're doing like the intervention for her and mm. like how they're going to send her to, to the, the camp. camp and I love how she has this idea in her head where she's listening but I have a boyfriend and but I'm a cheerleader and but I like make out with him all the time and it's fine and then they're coming up with things where they're like um you touch me all the time at practice inappropriately and your locker is filled with pictures of women and then the fucking tofu <laughs> she comes she holds up the tofu and she's like you always try to get a seat this and I was like oh damn I really feel called out by that tofu but <laughs> 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 but it's very yeah. relatable for that to see her like but i'm doing everything i'm quote supposed to do like mm. why are we here i i go to church with y'all i am on the cheer team and i have a boyfriend what else do you want me to do yeah and i think that that really speaks to a very internalized experience of being queer at least one that i feel like i can relate to that like i do this i do this and still kind of feeling like that that disconnect from your own self i think that 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 really just speaks to that experience and that's part of why i really really love this movie because it has such impactful social commentary that like really speaks to a lot of these experiences that is done in a way that I think up until that point had never really been done before. And especially like this kind of representation, is it perfect? No, but like this kind of representation in 1999 is still something to be celebrated. Um, and just the, the way that they create that social commentary by subverting the conversion therapy by subverting that intervention you know just how like ridiculously absurd it makes everything but in a way that is just like still very digestible because they they use comedy to kind of lighten that blow a little bit yeah i think that's why it's really stuck around for so long and why it still is being talked about and still being you know seen by you know, younger people, I think it really has that. It's comfortable enough to watch where you're mm -hmm. not like, it's not like a really graphic drama where you're like, oh, this is like really hard to digest and it's really hard to see, even if it's important. But this movie, you can kind of watch, you can kind of like laugh and, you know, you feel light, even though it's like a heavier subject. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think that, like, really the, the cinematography withstands time as well. Because just, like, the way that they use the camera, like, the camera work is really, really good. Like, when I rewatched it, there were a lot of scenes that I didn't notice initially. Like, the way that the camera angles change and how that also impacts the storytelling. Like, for example, when they are watching the training video during one of their <laughs> sessions in the very pink room, Natasha Leon's character 
character and Clea Duval, they're like subtly holding hands, kind of holding arms a little bit. Like it just it was it was very, very intimate. And I feel like it really spoke to an experience, especially when I was younger and like figuring out who I was and like, oh, I like when you touch my arm like that. Yeah, and I also like the different types of high schooler that they had at the like rehab center. Mm -hmm. I was I was like, that's really interesting that they're doing like different archetypes of queer people. And again, kind of like subverting that because like uh, Dolph, the athlete, Mm -hmm. he was like, oh, you know, it feels so good to like talk about it because I can't talk about it with any of the boys. And, you know, I guess especially during that time, like a very stereotypical athlete, especially like a dude who plays football, like very heteronormative. And they're like, "Mm, nope, we're going to include him in here Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah and they had the really like femme presenting woman and then the very like opposite end of that spectrum and and talking about (laughs) how what was that scene in the um when they're trying to get her to figure out like her route oh yeah and or maybe it was a little before that, but they were saying like, oh yeah, Which well, I love is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, in itself, really? like, yes. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I'm gay because my mother wore pants. <laughs> Kathy's character, Mary, and she was just like, that's right. That's right. Like, so <laughs> funny. And or like how the mom had to work for like less than a year for Megan's family. And oh. they're like, hmm. <laughs> right and what's really interesting is like something that kind of still happens today is that Mary's character was almost weaponizing that therapy talk of like oh that's it you don't respect your father because these roles were blah blah blah, blah and just really went on with the therapy talk and was weaponizing that against her because you know that's not really what happened she's just gay because she's gay like but yeah, the root. <laughs> the root. I also yeah. like how this isn't really set in a certain time period. Mm-hmm. And I love I love that because they're pulling different like belief. Like I felt like Mary's character was very like brought up post war and is very like women have to they're not working anymore. There's no need for us to be working. We're all at home. We all got the goofy skirts on and our pearls. And her house is all clean. And I feel like every character kind of comes from a different time period. And like what kind of baggage they're coming into it with. Yeah, and even Mary, when she was describing the feelings. Like, oh, when you see a woman and yes, her she's- <laughs> like smooth legs or like whatever she says. Like she's definitely speaking from experience because she's felt those things. And it didn't really click until you just said that now of like post-war, like very stereotypical roles. Uh, you know, she's she's a little closeted gay. So she also feels that too. And I, you can even tell she's also unsatisfied with that. That she knows that that's what she's supposed to do, quote unquote. But she doesn't really feel that way. And I think she sees a lot of like herself in her son Rocky. And that's why she's and like that's extra why, hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why she is like drinking like a man. <laughs> and he's he's so funny. Like in rewatching it, he's just like, "What? Sorry." <laughs> like his his reactions are very um animated and it it definitely makes the character come alive a little bit more. And when they're doing the tests, he like puts down he's got like a shovel or something and he just is like stroking <laughs> And all the other men are trying to pass this, like, hetero test. And they're all just like, oh, God. And then RuPaul is, like, always, like, wanting something you can't have. (laughs) One thing that I also wanted to touch on was its commentary on religious institutions. That, like, Megan's parents, I think, like a lot of parents, are well-intentioned, but not doing the right thing because ultimately they're weaponizing their religion to send her to a conversion therapy camp but i think that like her dad kind of coming around at the end like going to the p flag meeting like i really think that that was the movie's way of showing that like religion and queerness don't have to be opposing ideologies or opposing ideas i think some of the parents especially megan's parents 
went from how are other people going to look at us? We got our daughter doing everything right, but here she is still like a lesbian. That's going to look bad on us. To they're like actively fighting against that stereotype. Being like, we don't have to, our family doesn't have to be a certain way. My family's still great. And they're like talking to other parents about it specifically the dad the mom is obviously still a little hesitant at the end she was kind of hiding but she was still in the room and I thought that was really cool to kind of show a parent kind of making a full circle yeah and I'm glad that not that like I'm glad that her mom didn't come around but I'm glad that that was shown because I feel like it would be really unrealistic to like oh happy ending you know now both parents accept me and we're going to this p-flag meeting like you know that it does take time and I think that not all parents are perfect or families are perfect in the way that, you know, our dynamics impact each other, but that she's there, she's trying. And I, I think that that is really, really important and was super cool to see. Yeah, I really loved. So the like, what were they called? It was the people who like used to go to that therapy camp and then they kind of like broke off and formed their own like, like alliance group mm-hmm. to like help those they're called like Lair Bear, like the main couple. Yeah, like, I can't remember. Lair but Bear. I, I like rewound it a bunch to try to figure out what their real name is. But anyway, their communication when they were like fighting a little bit when Megan first came in, I was like, what a great way to show like supportive relationship communication. Because it was just very like, it just makes me feel like this. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for that. And they just like hug. And they're doing it in front of these like two kids who are just like basically escaped this camp and they Mm -hmm. come over here and they're seeing like well they have a nice house they always have dinner they support each other and they're Mm -hmm. helping other people on this new journey i was like what a great way to show that i just love them (laughs) those two are so cute yeah and it's again just that subversion because it's like here's this queer couple who isn't following like those heteronormative uh, I guess, like, roles within the, the conversation and within the relationship. And that, like, they have a healthy relationship. And so, you know, I, I feel like people can think what they want to about queer relationships. But, like, here is an example of, like, we are communicating. We are saying how we feel. Like, you know, it's just a, a good, healthy queer relationship. And that was really good to see on screen as well. So let's talk some more about like kind of Megan and Graham's growth, because I feel like they're kind of like the main protagonists in the film. And obviously, Megan, because we're like, you know, watching her journey from, oh, I didn't even know that I was a lesbian to <laughs> this like very almost religious experience of like admitting I'm a homosexual to being in a queer relationship at the end that like I really loved seeing Megan's growth and you know it's not like her relationship with Graham was just picture perfect like okay I'm queer now everything's fine that they had to navigate some parental kind of dynamics together and I think that that was really cool to get to see and like you know, a really important part of her journey. What What were your thoughts about her journey or Graham's? Yeah, I think I could definitely see how Megan and Graham fell in love with each other. I can see the kind of like, Graham is very questioning on like, why are we doing things? It could be something simple all the way to like, well, why do you cheer? Why are cheer? Like, why are you wanting to do that? And Megan was very like, because it's simple and it makes me happy. And she never like questioned things before as we know from the beginning where she didn't know that she was a lesbian she kind of is like oh i'm where she's she's like i'm a homosexual and she's like a bit coming down so yeah and and graham seemed to be very like yeah my parents don't like this and that sucks but i'm just gonna do what i can and play their game until i can get out of here and do what i really want to do even you know at the expense of megan for a little bit And Megan really had to show up for Graham because I don't think a lot of people had, I mean, just judging on when her parents came in and had that like group therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think Megan being the kind of like sweet and like shows up for people really enticed Graham. And I think Graham being the very like asking questions and kind of getting her to think more really enticed Megan. And yeah, they definitely balanced each other well. Yeah, they did. And like the very end when I thought she was going to go through with the like ceremony, I was like, no, don't do this. I was like, I don't want some lame like 
oh, and then they come back like years later and they see each other and kind of okay. I was like, no, they need to like show everyone here that they are together. And I thought that scene was really cute and wrote her a little cheer. Like, that's cute. They like kind of bonded over writing that cheer that one time. I thought that was so neat how they did that. Yeah, well, and like, it was interesting that I feel like the more Megan kind of came out and became comfortable with herself, the more Graham kind of like reclused into herself. That like it was like a opposite journey happening all at the same time, but then they were able to come together at the end. You know, Megan left the camp. She went to go stay with um the healthy, happy gay couple, and then she's the one who's like fighting for Graham. But like you said, like Graham is the more rebellious one who is like. I, I feel like more naturally kind of fighting the system. But, you know, she gets scared because her parents threaten her inheritance. And, you know, she she gets scared. And so she, she has to do what she feels like she has to do. But then it's Megan's kind of like sweet nature that brings her back and reminds her of like who she really is. And they're able to actually be together, which I think is really, really sweet. That's so true about how she, they kind of almost had like, at one point, it kind of shifted. She kind of turned into herself, and she kind of had to start feeling outward. Megan had to in ways she hadn't. That's so true. Mm-hmm. Is there? What do you think they're doing after the movie? Like, what do you think happened to Graham and they? Um, I want to think that they are just gay and happy <laughs> somewhere. You know, because I. I think that there could be some, like, points of contention for them, for sure. Like, uh, Megan seems to come from a very religious family. But I think that, like, by showing at the end them kind of, like, coming around, that, like, there could be some balance in feeling, like, really grounded both with her religion and in herself. And they seem to come from, like, different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, so I feel like maybe that would be a point of tension for them as well, like later on in their relationship. But I think that, like we've mentioned, Megan really grounds Graham and like kind of keeps her feet on the ground. But then also vice versa, that Graham challenges Megan to to question more. So I I, I want to think that they're they're gay and happy somewhere. Um, you know, maybe they they had some really big fights, but it worked it out. I I hope. What about you? What do you think? Okay, so I thought about this a lot. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Is what I think. I think after, first of all, scary, scary that they had to do that at like a young age in front of like family and friends. And like she, I mean, especially um, Megan, she came back from like a completely different person. Like that would be really scary to go through. But I think after graduation, I think Graham started going to like an art school. Mm -hmm. And I think she went out of state. I want to think like, Somewhere a little more progressive, somewhere she they both felt a little more comfortable. And then Megan also went and she got her like teaching license. And mm. she teaches like English or something, but she's the cheerleading captain at the high school. Okay. Or the captain or the the what's it called? The um the coach. The coach. <laughs> yeah, she she's the cheerleading coach. She's the coach and the and captain. The cap- <laughs> she's like, you can't do it. That C is my. So she does that for the high school. And then Graham is an art dealer and an synchronous dealer. Okay. So that's what I planned out for them. And they both have crazy colored hair. <laughs> yeah, they both have crazy hair. They have like a really cute, like one bedroom apartment. And they mm. have like a really ugly dog that they adopted to be kind of like this dog. No one's gonna adopt this dog. Like it's like it's been here for years, and they adopted like this like wonky looking dog. But everyone thinks it's like actually really cute because it's so ugly. It's cute. Okay, and and septum piercings because they gotta piercings. let everybody know. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So I guess we can kind of talk about the end a little bit. So I, I definitely think that this is the queer joy that everybody needs. It does have a happy ending. It's just, it's so rare <laughs> that you get that. Like, you know, I've I've talked about it on my podcast before about the barrier gaze trope. And honestly, for a lot of queer characters in TV and just in general that unfortunately they either don't get to be on the show or like... What we're seeing right now, a lot of shows are being canceled. Like we mentioned A League of Their Own. It's not getting a second season and that breaks my heart. So um, it's really, really nice to get to see a, a queer joy happy ending with both characters intact i have this quote in the movie they're asked to perform their gender a lot and rue paul has this really great quote we are born naked everything else is drag oh and so i feel like it represents the film really well uh that they definitely have to perform their gender and their heterosexuality i feel like we did we didn't even get to the part where they actually perform their heterosexuality i have some thoughts about that part i i feel like it just gives me the ick it's probably the worst part of the movie but like because it's so cringy like the absurdity you know the satire it's it's not bad but it's just like whoa that. (laughs) <laughs> no, like glued on leaves on the bodysuit. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, so if you have no idea what we're talking about because you've never seen the film, uh, but you're still listening to this episode, thank you. But so there's like a a scene where they have to literally perform their heterosexuality by engaging in a simulated sex scene, essentially, but. They're not actually having sex. They're like watch- wearing these body suits that have leaves where your private parts go. <laughs> and then they just like get on top of each other and in the suits and pretend to have sex. And then, then that's it. And it's so funny because like when they're practicing, Mary even says like, like he was talking about like cleaning up or something. And she was like, like, oh, no, like. Real men just like like whack it and jack it or like I don't I can't remember yeah, what she said, says. They said what about foreplay? And she's like, oh, real men don't do foreplay. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Like real men don't do foreplay. Like Hafna. And it was like she was already mad at the question. Like as soon as she said, she was like, oh god, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that <laughs> that part is is really interesting, but. Um, I would say overall, it's a solid movie. It has a good, happy ending for all the queer folks out there. I watched it with my mom, mm-hmm. uh, and she thought it was hilarious. And so, you know, if you have someone who's in your life who wants to be an ally, watch the movie with them. Definitely recommend it. And uh, thank you so much, Haley, for being on the show. And if you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening to Closeted History. I appreciate you, and I'll see you the next time, friend.